actually learning to land or take off consists in learning to handle the airplane as though it were two separate and distinct vehicles, as different from each other as, well, say, a motorcycle and a speedboat. On the ground, the plane has handling characteristics which are entirely different from those that exhibit in the air. Then there is the transitional period when the plane is partly a ground vehicle and partly airborne. When you start your takeoff, you're taxiing. When you finish it, you're flying. When you begin a landing, you're flying. When you finish it, you're taxiing. So, in between these two points, you are in effect taxiing and flying both at once, in varying degrees. But don't let that worry you. Landings and takeoffs are largely a combination of other abilities which you will have learned previously. For example, you can't make good landings or takeoffs until you know how to handle the plane on the ground as well as in the air. So you first learn to taxi. At the outset, make sure that you have your seat as high as you can get it and still have full throw of the rudder pedals. If you're not very tall, you may have to use a cushion behind your back so you can comfortably operate the rudder pedals. If it seems necessary, don't hesitate to use the cushion. It will be supplied to you upon request. Your heels rest on the deck when you're flying, taking off, or landing. But when you're taxiing, have your feet well up on the pedals so you can easily operate the brakes by pressing forward with the ball of your foot. When every detail of your cockpit check is completed and you're ready to leave the line, adjust your goggles, glance at the tower for a flag or light signals to be sure you're clear to taxi out, and unlock your tail wheel. With your throttle at idling, stick back, and your brakes full on, give your plane captain the thumbs up signal to remove the wheel shots. Now watch your plane captain and follow his signal. He will guide you out onto the taxi strip. When the plane captain does this, he means come ahead. This means turn in the direction he is pointing, that is, to your left. So, of course, this means turn to your right. This means hold your left brake for a sharp left turn. And when he does this, he wants you to hold your right brake for a sharp right turn. This motion means slow down. Here, he's telling you to stop. And here, to stop where you are, or as quickly as possible. Your plane captain is there to help you. Follow his signals except when, in your judgment, they're in error. Bear in mind that you are at all times responsible for your airplane and for any damage it may cause to personnel or equipment, regardless of signals from the plane captain. There's nothing especially difficult about taxiing. Strangely enough, the majority of accidents in primary training happen on the ground. So one quick way to get into trouble is improper taxiing. Oh, yes, McTribble. You know, we like to talk things over with you fellows occasionally to see how you're getting along. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I just had a problem come up. I'd like to ask your opinion on it. Yes, sir. Got a couple of pictures here. What sort of disciplinary action do you think you should be subjected to, McTribble? Well, uh, very severe, sir. Yes. Here's another one going too fast, had to stop quickly, stepped on his brakes too hard. What would you think of a cadet who did that, McDribble? Well, uh, very unfortunate, sir. Would you like to know who was responsible for these accidents? Yes, sir. Cadet Sylvester McDribble. Yes, sir. McDribble, you apparently aren't aware of the importance of taxi correctly. We discussed these accidents for the time they happened. Now you're on report again. According to this, you are guilty of taxiing too fast, failing to F-turn, not keeping your hands on the controls, and not watching where you're going. Also, on the uh, night of the month, as you left the line, you held your brakes and applied unnecessary throttle, working brakes against throttle in such a way that your crop has blue calling and other loose gear about endangering personnel and equipment. I believe you suggested severe disciplinary action. Did you not, McDribble? Well, uh, yes, sir. Very well. We will endeavor to follow your suggestion. Yes, you can get into a lot 
lot of trouble through improper taxiing. But let's go back again to the point where you're ready to leave the line. Be sure your tail wheel is unlocked. Then give it a little throttle to start it rolling. And incidentally, when taxiing, as when flying, keep your hand on the throttle at all times. Let the plane roll straight ahead for a couple of feet because it's much easier to start a turn when the plane is moving. A good pilot takes pride in using a minimum of throttle for leaving the line and for taxiing. In getting out of a tight spot requiring sharp turns, you use full rudder, applying brake intermittently as necessary, and using moderate blast from the throttle to help push the tail around. But take throttle off again the instant you don't need it, thereby avoiding max mistake of using too much throttle and holding the plane back with too much brake. And wherever possible, avoid holding the brake steadily, because this locks the wheel, twisting the tire, and grinding off the tread rubber. Using the brakes intermittently will get you around almost as sharply, and will allow both wheels to turn, thus saving the tire. In all taxiing, remember that your brakes are a delicate mechanism and wear out quickly. Save them for the time when you really need them. Under normal conditions, taxiing speed should not be faster than a brisk walk. And in congested areas, it may have to be even slower. The only way you can see what's ahead of you is to S-turn. And here's a tip on S-turn. Under normal conditions, as soon as the turn starts, start stopping it. Suppose you're beginning a turn to the right. As soon as the turn is started, you apply full left rudder. Then, if you're still turning to the right when you want to start back the other way, help the turn with a little left brake, applying brake lightly and using only as much as is necessary. Control your speed and help your turns with the throttle, using brake only when necessary. If for some reason you get yourself into an emergency situation where you have to slow down suddenly, be careful about applying both brakes at once. It's much safer to apply them this way. And should you ever suddenly step on your brakes and find them ineffective, try pumping them. They're hydraulic brakes and react much the same as the hydraulic brakes on an automobile. Also, under normal wind conditions, keep your stick back. If you carry the stick in a forward position, the prop blast may tend to lift the tail, particularly if you have to stop suddenly. This is especially true if you're taxiing into a wind, because then you have the strength of the wind plus the prop blast trying to lift the tail. But with a stick back, both the headwind and the prop blast tend to push the tail down instead of up. In taxiing with the wind behind you, Keep your stick in about the neutral position to minimize the chances of your tail being lifted either by the prop blast from ahead or the tailwind from behind. And taxi slowly. If you're taxiing in a strong crosswind with the wind coming from somewhere on your right, it will attempt to lift your right wing. So put your stick over to the right to help hold down your right wing. In other words, put your stick into the wind. If the wind is on your left, you put your stick to the left, into the wind, helping to hold the left wing down. On the ground, the airplane is like a weather vane. It wants to turn into the wind. For example, if you're taxiing in an easterly direction and there is a brisk wind from the north, the plane wants to turn to the north. So if you want to taxi in a strong crosswind, you get the plane turned onto the course you want it to follow, and then lock the tail wheel. This will help a lot in keeping the plane from turning into the wind. Then when you want to turn off this given course, naturally you must again unlock the tail wheel. And here are a word of warning. Many a student and occasionally an experienced pilot come to grief when taxiing behind parked planes because someone unexpectedly started to test his mags. A plane will weathercock into a slipstream just as it will weathercock into the wind. So if you must taxi behind other planes, be on the lookout for this sort of thing. When you come to the edge of the takeoff and landing area, look around for incoming planes. Planes landing always have the right of way, so 
Don't ever cross the landing or take off mat or strip without first looking around carefully for incoming traffic. When all is clear, taxi out to your takeoff position. Just before you turn on to your takeoff heading, look down the field to be sure your takeoff path is clear. And look to the other side for landing planes. Then swing smartly around its position so you're headed exactly down the specified takeoff course. Roll ahead a few feet and straighten the tail wheel and lock. If there's a takeoff line on the mat from which you're taking off, don't crowd it in your turn. Make your turn in the takeoff position wide enough so you have room to complete the turn and roll ahead a few feet to straighten your tail wheel without crossing the line. Drop your seat down into flying position so when you look along the top of the fuselage, you are also looking through the center of the windscreen. And drop your heels to the deck. Check the tower quickly for light signals and be sure the course flag is up. Take a last look behind you for incoming planes. Then advance throttle smoothly and positively, all the way forward. But let's stop right here for a moment to emphasize the importance of getting off the ground as quickly as you safely can. For example, here sits Cadet McDribble, casually carrying out his cockpit check, which he should have completed before leaving the line, and holding up a whole flight by creating a traffic jam like Saturday night on Main Street. But if you get everything all set before you ever taxi away from the line, then when you do get to the takeoff position, you have only to follow this simple routine. Look for incoming traffic. Glance at your takeoff path. Swing around into position and roll ahead a few feet. Lock your tail wheel, drop your seat to the flying position, and your heels to the deck. Glance at the tower. And the very last thing, look back once more to be sure there's no danger of collision with landing planes. Then advance the throttle smoothly and positively all the way forward. One other precaution at this point. Don't snap the throttle forward. Here's what may happen to you if you do. In an emergency where you suddenly needed power badly, that could be very serious. And more important, Sudden application of throttle will give you a lot of torque suddenly and at slow speeds, which may cause you to swerve or even to ground move. So get in the habit of smooth, positive application of throttle. You'll feel the effects of torque in any case when you apply throttle for the takeoff. So be on the lookout for any tendency to swerve to the left. As you begin your takeoff run, keep your tail firmly on the ground and the locked tail wheel will help keep you straight. Then, as you begin to pick up speed and your controls become more effective, ease the nose down into the takeoff attitude. And once you have that attitude, simply hold it until the plane becomes airborne. In that attitude, it's bound to fly as soon as you have enough speed. Once you're off the ground, continue to hold your takeoff attitude until the plane has plenty of lift and buoyancy, and you can safely ease the nose up a little into the normal climbing position. When you're sure of clearing all obstacles and have passed the boundaries of the field, smoothly retard throttle to the climbing setting to save your engine. But don't be in too much of a hurry to retard the throttle. And don't bring it back any further than the three-quarters position. After you're beyond the boundaries of the field and at a safe altitude, which is usually about 200 feet above the ground, begin a climbing turn in whichever direction the course rules call for. One of the most important things to be learned in connection with the takeoff is to keep the path of the airplane absolutely straight. From the standpoint of safety, a straight takeoff is important right from the start. The pilot who allows his plane to swerve risks a collision, and since takeoff collisions are too close to the ground for a parachute jump, they're often fatal. In that part of the takeoff run during which you're on the ground, you keep the plane straight with your rudder. You'll have to use quite a lot of rudder at first, but as 
speed picks up, you'll need less and less until you have flying speed and become airborne. In the takeoff, as in virtually all of flying, you have to see several different things at once. You look well ahead of the airplane so that you always have before you a complete picture of the scenery on either side of the nose. Not just the ground down close, but all the scenery clear up to the horizon and above. By watching the nose in relation to the scenery, you can tell whether or not the plane is swerving. If the nose does not move to one side or the other over the scenery, then you're going straight. In this next takeoff, we're going to deliberately allow the plane to swerve. By watching the scenery in relation to the nose, you can tell which way the plane is swerving. Another important factor in both landings and takeoffs is keeping the wings level. Notice in this takeoff that our right wing is slightly lower than the left. So as soon as we become airborne, we begin to turn. A wing low takeoff means we either turn or slip upon becoming airborne. At this stage of your training, either one can be very dangerous. Another common mistake in the takeoff is getting the nose down too low. As the plane picks up speed, you should bring the nose down about this attitude. But if you push it down too far, like this, for example, you will needlessly prolong your takeoff run. A nose low takeoff attitude might give you a takeoff path something like this. Contrast that with the takeoff path made by a plane using the correct takeoff attitude. So under normal conditions, the correct takeoff attitude gives you a shorter takeoff run and more altitude in less time. But let's look at the other extreme to see what happens when you try to take off with the nose too high. Suppose instead of bringing the nose down to this position, you only brought it down to here. In that case, the plane would pull up too sharply and would probably stall, bouncing you back onto the ground. Also, as we pointed out previously, when a plane is ready to fly, you need only to raise the nose slightly to help it off the ground. Even though you have assumed the correct takeoff attitude, if you raise the nose too sharply, or if you bring it up too high, you will probably cause the plane to stall so it again bounces you back onto the ground. Still another common mistake is made by the student who gets the plane into the air correctly, raising the nose just the right amount, but fails to hold the takeoff attitude and allows the wheels to touch the ground again. So once you have it off the ground, hold it off. And except under unusual conditions, hold the nose in that same attitude until you have picked up enough speed so it's safe to ease up into a climb. Get the plane in the correct climbing attitude, which has already been demonstrated, then trim it for that attitude. One other precaution which we haven't mentioned, when you're ready to make your climbing turn, look back first on the side toward which you're going to turn. In fact, never make a turn anywhere without looking first.